Hello everyone, welcome to Eddie and Jimmy, and if you want to subscribe, do that on Nine Now and YouTube. Jimmy Bartell, welcome. We've got some great sponsors lined up this year. Our old mate Andrew Moore's come good again from Lexus of Blackburn. And Crown, the place for entertainment, where you go, beautiful restaurants, lots of fun at Crown. They're going to be our sponsors throughout the year as well. G'day, Jimmy. Hey, Ed. How's your summer been? My summer's been fantastic. I've been flat out. I was at the Super Bowl, uh, running around everywhere, lots of sports events. Watched yesterday, which we'll get into in a few moments' time, the uh, game from Las Vegas, the NRL t- doubleheader, uh, in the uh, Allegiant Stadium that I was at. So plenty to talk about there. I want to get into that that marketing of football around the world. I want to ask you, uh, a little birdie told me that there's some people that do things in style, some people are just very low-key, and a, a very famous Collingwood, and actually had a few games at Carlton, uh, Daisy Thomas. Had a wedding. Congratulations to, to Daisy getting married to his uh, longtime partner. But there was a certain person who just gathered all the attention on their arrival by th- taking a helicopter to and from. Uh, well, so I, the, I, I, the gather the, I gather the attention anyway, so yeah, don't yeah. worry about that. That's not a big deal. No, well, it was out in the middle of nowhere. It was up there. I don't know where it was. Uh, out, it was 30 minutes away from Dunkeld, which is <laughs> about three and a half hours away from from Melbourne, and I actually had to fly out to the Super Bowl the next morning, so yes, I did. Yeah, I heard uh, people had to hide under tables because the helicopter was coming no, in. No, we, we landed in a, <laughs> in a suitable uh, adjoining paddock, and uh, we were picked up, but yes, we did. We landed uh, there, uh, and uh, then had to depart uh, before last line, yeah. about 10 to 9, and from what I hear, it was probably a good thing to do to leave at that stage, because <laughs> things got very excited a bit later in the night. I think they all had a very good time. Yeah. But uh, congratulations to, uh, to Daisy and, yes. uh, and everyone who was up there. It was a fantastic setup. So it was great to go. Yeah. But yes, I did fly. You're a very rock star of you, Well, Ed. it's not, you know, I mean, I'm not Bronwyn Bishop. I don't have to <laughs> answer to anybody. So I paid and that's mm. that. So yeah. and, <laughs> that uh, worked. No. Good form of transport, the choppers. Uh, well, so I used to fly five times a day in a chopper when I was working at Channel 10 from basically the age of 18. We used to fly into the into the footy grounds to do the interviews. I was doing a, a segment called Doing the Rounds, which was the first sort of full-on footy segment. So I'd fly in and uh, Kevin Egan, who was the footy manager at Essendon in those days, loved helicopters mm. and aircrafts and, fair enough, being a bomber. So what I'd do is I'd ring him and say, I need to interview Sheeds or Simon Madden or Tim Watson or somebody. And I'd fly in, land at Windy Hill on the ground. Kevin Egan would jump the, uh, in the chopper, go for a joyride. I'd do the interview. He'd land, I'd get back in. And then we'd fly over to Geelong. And we'd go somewhere else, down to Moorabbin. The only place we couldn't land was Princess Park because the local residents used to go, oh, they still carry on a bit down there. But uh, uh, I remember one time we had to go to Coburg's yeah, ground, I think. Well, you didn't have the Lindsay Fox agreement. Like everyone just cleared the ground at the, the school and all. No, no, we had that. That, that, that's the, that was the agreement. You could land anywhere. Yeah. I could land in your backyard. So long as you could <laughs> land and you had permission in those days, it was great. But uh, so we used to uh, leave from what is now the uh, the AIA centre, Collingwood there, the, where the ground is. That used to be Olympic Park uh, helicopter centre yeah. and uh, the dog track was behind it. And you also had Yarra Bank. They were the two areas in the city that you, you took off and landed from. So, no, it was, we used to do it all the time. And one last quick one. Yeah. While we're talking public transport, someone yes. else who's had a bit of transport <laughs> issues, uh, you're not going to become the Lord Mayor? No. You're going to Sally, take over Sally Caps role? No, I've got no interest whatsoever. <laughs> As I said, I'd rather well, be the Carlton president than uh, be I did the, the Lord Mayor. I mean, <laughs> seriously. I mean, You've been look, asked a lot of times, and your, your answer's always been, I'd, I'd rather do something else. No, but the, the, the thing for me is you don't have that much power. I mean, you go into a council. I mean, I'd I'd have to be dealing with the Greens and Mm. factions and people undermining you. Once you get in that political system, the factionism. I went up to the Constitutional Convention in 1998 and and was involved in it firsthand. And I watched it all happen in front of me. And I thought, that's not for me. I wouldn't last in this. And, you know, I've seen it with my brother in in state politics. was there for 10 years. The, the, The factions just destroy any creativity. And there's always somebody standing on the mark. And uh, the Herald Sun rang me and said, oh, you know, we think it'd be great, we need you to do it. And, you know, I had a lot of really good support. I was quite, you know, I was quite taken aback by mm. the level of support for me to do it. But I said to the Herald Sun, what, so you can follow me around to see if I'm <laughs> having a, you know, a bottle of champagne or if I go overseas on a, on a you know, a mission, whether I'm in business class or, no, mm. I'm not doing that. I, no. I, I, I'll tell you what I would do. If they turned it into a commission and they said basically go in and I'd do it for free to help Melbourne. I'd be very happy to give my ideas on things. Um, even now, I, I'd rather mm. do it as a, as a service 
But I don't want to be doing that. And I haven't got time in my life these days to be doing citizenship ceremonies mm. and wearing I would have loved to have seen you on a scooter too, by the way. down for the Birdman rally and all that sort of stuff. I've, I've, I've done a lot of that, mm. but I would like to get to the nub of things. I mean, yeah. I reckon I've got a policy to fix up the traffic and homeless. Interestingly enough, I was in Dallas, Texas, uh, around the time of the Super Bowl. And Dallas was a, a city that was known as the city of hate after the John F. Kennedy assassinations and for a long time. So they thought, right, what do we do? So they've cleaned their city up. Literally, they've said, we want to be the cleanest city going. Yep. And you walk around and it is spotless. It looks beautiful. And it's interesting, with the, when it is so clean, you actually feel... Um, there's a bit of pride. Well, there's also you feel safe. Hmm. And their homeless situation, what they did is they decided, okay, there's always going to be homeless, but let's go and find out who the homeless are. So they're going to speak to one person who you find out has you know, fallen through the cracks of life or maybe had a drug addiction. You find somebody else who's mentally impaired who just can't do things. So they then got the right social workers in and put them into the right programs to get them off the streets. So I reckon I saw about four people who were living rough and some of those people are people who like to live rough. Mm. So uh, there's a lot of there's mm. a lot of things you could do pretty quickly, I think, in Melbourne to get it up to shape pretty quickly. But yep. I'm not going to be the Lord Mayor. Yeah. No, footy's, footy's your thing. Exactly. And footy's around the corner now. <laughs> so let's talk about the yeah. footy. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm excited for the footy season. I thought, I know we touched on it post-grand final, but... Well, let's, well, not, let's, not over, let's not go past the grand final too quickly. No, no, but <laughs> I don't think I've ever re-watched a grand final. I've never re-watched a grand final that I've, I've played in. But, um, you know, with today, you know, all the TV channels and streaming services, you get replays It was on up. yesterday, by the way. Did you watch yeah, it? I did see it pop up. <laughs> again, I think in retrospect and seeing it again in highlights, the quality of that grand final was yeah. extraordinary. And I know sometimes um, grand finals, just because there's such a tussle, there's nervous tension or weather plays a factor. If you just actually look at the game, I'm not saying they're, they're not great games because they're close, but the actual quality of the game, sometimes they're, they're not the best quality game over the whole season. They're super because of their grand final. We've got big high stakes. Yeah, preliminary finals are usually the better yeah. games, aren't they? Cause you're... But the actual quality of Brisbane and yeah. Collingwood and that second quarter where there was a 20-minute patch, like Link McCarthy snap out of a pocket, Collingwood, some of the goals that were actually kicked by individuals were as top shelf as if, you know... Well, you... Bailey's couple of goals were just fantastic. I thought yeah. he was going to be the bloke. To break our hearts there. But, one you know, stage. the old, if you put up a highlights package on the VHS to show people in the time machine. Look, there was a 20-minute patch in that grand final where you go, that is some of the best football I've seen. It was a high-quality grand so final. So, Jim, do I, I put it to you then. Is it because the tactics have changed? Uh, you know, we've been going around the boundary line and defensive. Get stoppages for a long time. You know, knock mm. it over the line out of bounds, get another put throw in mm. or a ball up. Everyone dive mm. on top of the ball. Whereas both of these teams use the corridor a lot more, um, particularly you know, Collingwood have changed their play, given the fact they've got some blokes who can actually yeah. play. So you've got the Dacos boys who hit you right on the chest every time. Yeah, Pendlebury was supli- sublime. Um, oh, crisp. Uh, crisp has been fantastic. Yeah. Dagoe. So the foot skills coming out of defence, you've got Howe, mm. you've got uh, Moore, you've got these guys. So they actually take the game on. Mm. And in fact, the, the games that Collingwood have won by those small margins have all been won by daring and skill. Yes, proactive, positive yeah. football. And, so, and hopefully that's, you know, from what we've seen mm. even with North Melbourne, they're playing a far more running yeah. game this yeah. year. Football is an evolution. So what happens first is a coach or a group or clubs think the great defensive mechanisms and that locks the game down and then we have all this state of football discussion, football's ruined, it's not like how it used to be. It, football's never going to be like how it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. It's going to be different and it's going to be exciting. So what happens is, and I'll go through my time into this time, is it was long kicking, you kick it down the line, high mark, turn around, long kick, high mark, which then turned into man-on-man defending. I've got you for the game, mm-hmm. and we're doing it. So I think West Coast Sydney Grand Finals, epic games, low scoring. Then it turned into the way to beat that, quick handball. you got to get it because there'll be someone off the chain, and then you get that movement. Then we've got clusters and grids and all the different catch names. Yeah. Clarko's cluster, West Coast's web, all, they all got their names. Collingwood uh, did it. But that was actually really come back, defend. Defend, yeah. So you get back into your back 50 and you try and score between 17, 18 of us in front of you. Good luck. Now the way to counter that, and you see that with Richmond, it's gain, it's handball, it's forward movement, is it's almost like taking driver off the tee. I'll solve all my problems down there in our attacking yep. zone. So what happens now is sides just get out of your back 50 
And if it's in our front half, and then we... Hard to kick a goal from your, uh, the forward 50 of yeah. the opposition, isn't it? We but, mightn't uh, score, but you can't score from, uh, from way back there. Or what we're asking you to do is beat us in four individual plays in a row. So you've got to, you've got to win it in your back 50, then you've got to beat us at half back, then you've got to beat us in the middle of the ground, and then you've got to be good enough to kick a goal. I, I remember at one stage um, during the 2000s, and uh, I went over and... Uh, for the Irish game, for the Australia versus Ireland. And Australia was coached and had a fair dinkum All-Australian team in and they behaved beforehand, so they were ready to play. <laughs> and uh, Alistair Clarkson was the coach, Ross Lyon was the assistant, Chris Scott was the other assistant. Some big brains there. So he had the big brains. Mm. Well, this is the point I want to make. Mm. So he had the big brains and we went out and played what was basically the Clarko style of play and had been adopted by everyone. And I used to do my head in at Collingwood because we'd try and play that same game, mm. except they played it better. So what do you reckon happens? They, they can't knock it us off. Yeah. Sometimes just late in the game. But, uh, you know, anyway, so I watched the game. And the Irish people were laughing because they just went – they were playing back in whatever year it was. I'll say 2005. I don't know, I guess. Somebody look it up if you yeah. could. Um, but uh, 2005. Well, what they did was they played what we're playing now. Yeah. They played old-fashioned football. Had a, a, a tall ruck, a, a tall centre-half forward, strong marking centre-half forward couple of guys underneath him and handball forward mm. and into space and run. Mm. So breaking the lines. But they were going bang, bang, bang. And I came back and said to our guys, if you have a look at this Irish game. They, they, they've come up with a, you know, the, the winning formula. And uh, anyway, I don't think they did. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it's The, the, it's the game just evolves. Like, it does, yeah. But defence happens first. You, you find a way to crack defence and then – but that, that's like the game. And, and the big issue to evolving at the moment it, is concussion. Can I just, just before yeah. you go off that, can I just put one other thing that I've been thinking over the summer about? Yeah. For, for a long period of time, I'd speak to the various recruiting officers who said, again, through the 2000s, not a great, not a great uh, depth of players coming through. Yeah, they're okay. Every year there's a number one draft pick, hmm. but sometimes they're superstars and sometimes they're okay. Well, more better than okay, but, you know, but not superstars. I just wonder or not whether or we've just got better players coming through in the last few years. Better skillful players. The 18-year-old kids who are coming in like Sheasel and Dacos and these types of players are changing the face of teams because they get it 25 to 30 times and hit somebody 25 to 30 times. And I think that's I think I think there's a lot in that. I think that the underage teaching and coaching and setting up of players means we're getting better players coming through in the in the draft who are almost ready made in the first two years. Well ready made's all right. They're, they're exposure to elite programs. Yeah. I, I did my first pre season really proper like a first time I laid down on a bench press was at the Geelong Football Club. Yeah. Well if these kids would know about strength, conditioning, diet, running, all that sort of stuff years in advance before they hit the AFL system. Okay. You want to talk concussion? Well of course uh, the Jimmy Webster um, Okay, well let's, let's, let's do the usual, you know how many? How many? You know, Chuck Lotto, how many? Um, now, can, I'll just say this. It's not 10 weeks. I reckon I watched 10 minutes of uh, the Port Adelaide game the other the other day. I got home, flicked it on, then I had to go and do something. And what came to mind, and I marked it down for us to talk about on Footy Classified, was Sam Pal Pepper trying to clean somebody up. Not the one he got done for. Earlier on, I went, what is he doing? <laughs> the, the, does this... Do these guys not read the, the paper? Do they not get coached? Do they not get mm. told what's going on? And sure enough, I get the, my son comes home from work. He says, oh, I just see Sam Pelper. I said, no, what? I said, what did they get him for that one early mm. on? He said, no, I don't know about that one. Have a look at this one. Bang, he gets four. Mm. So we go to yesterday's game. Jimmy Webster. Jimmy Webster. Oh, and Jai Simpkin. Runs through Jai Simpkin as if he thought he was uh, Stan Magro cleaning up Alex Jezelenko back in the 70s. What, what do I think you'll get? Yeah. Six. Yeah, I think it's got to be four to six. I think uh, it'll be above four. I think it has to be above four. I think, I think he starts, they should come out straight off and say six. He can go to the tribunal and he should go to the tribunal, apologise and cop his whack and see if he can well, get a week off for doing so. Well, the way that they'll probably do that is if they want him to get six, they'll offer him seven and say you can argue the... Yeah. But... This is not one of those ones, oh, it's an accident, uh, you know, in the air and all this. Simpkin is exposed because he's kicking the football. Yeah. And he's gone, I'm going to squash him. And he gets him high. And so, but just this whole broader discussion, no one's learning, they're not learning, make an example of him. He'll be made an example of because he got it wrong. It was, he, 
he's tone deaf or he just hasn't been paying attention. But, 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 but the thing is, it is getting through. Yeah, it so, is. So, like... I, totally I, I, I don't want to make Byron it... Pickett nearly killed somebody one time. Didn't even get rubbed out. That's yeah. how, how much it's changed in yeah. recent times. It, it's getting... It is getting through. But when you've, when you've got a big cohort of players... And this, and this is not an excuse for Jimmy Webster and others, and people will, will howl me down. The attitudes are, tra- are changing because immediately, as soon as he did it, everyone knows. I reckon Jimmy Webster knows. Every Saints person knows he's gone. Yeah. But it's like anything in life. There is rules, and people still will break the rules. So as much as you say, they'll never learn. Well, yeah, there's always going to be one or two who are going to step out of line. There's still people who do get put up for striking. Yeah. But we've known for... Ever in a day, you can't clock someone. No, but that's, but I think your point's right. But I want to take it to another level. Um, I think society at the moment, where uh, people are getting caught for home invasions and all sorts of civil unrest and things, and they go before the magistrate and they come straight out. Hmm. So there, to me, there is a, per, a very much pervading um, mental position that you can get it, but there's always a wriggle room. And football's been absolutely that. Mm. Uh, the drug code, yep. um, this, tribunals, mm. all the rest of it. Let's just cut out the emotion. But we remember, right? We have to, I want to say this right now and put this in the time capsule. Remember, whatever he gets in pre season or round one equals preliminary final two. Yes. Okay. Now, that might come back to bite me if somebody at Collingwood mm. gets rubbed out, but, but I'm not involved these days. Mm. But I think the fairness is. As you said, everyone looked at that yesterday and you can quibble over four, five, six. If Pal Pepper gets four, his was worse. He had, he had mm. more time to pull up. You know, I thought, as I said, Pal Pepper was running around looking to, mm. to find trouble, and he did. But, uh, yeah, I think five or six. And that, that sets the tone. Mm. I, and, I think there's now also a greater consideration on the player getting... I'm not saying hit, you know, getting bumped. So there's, there's yeah. a greater consideration of the impact nowadays on Jai Simkin. Yeah. So I reckon normally the discussion would be Jimmy Webster, how many does he get? Or oh, did he get him? Oh, well, he, he'll miss this and that's it. But now it's like, well, Simkin's got to go through concussion protocols. Yep. He's had a couple of concussions in recent time. He's a captain. He's a leader. How's it go for his preparation leading to round one? I think that's now in, in the mix of decision-making. Yeah, well, okay, it's a, this is a vex problem because you don't want to have any victim shaming or anything else like that Mm. but we've spoken about having the concussion passport Mm -hmm. and uh, having real understanding of what's going on with people who've got concussion Um, so Simpkin gets cleaned up yesterday does he get knocked out because he's had a couple of concussions before and I'm heading towards Angus Brayshaw uh, in this situation again there I think What's happened with Angus is, is just tragic and, and terrible that it's happened to him over his career. Wonderful player, great family, all yep. that. Um, I think that Angus Brayshaw should be the example of what happens going forward now in his payout, his compensation, the physical and mental medical support that he gets going forward. Um, he's a very intelligent guy. I think he'll probably end up in the media. Mm. And you know what? At the end of his career at 27, with a propensity for concussion, he could well walk away in a really good situation. Not a bloke who's been beaten out of the game and has missed the last four years of his contract. Yeah, he'll never play mm. in the MCG again. He was like, not lucky. He, he deserved to win a premiership, yep. played in great teams, run up in a Brownlow medal or thereabouts, yep. and regarded as a genuine great player. So he can put that up on his wall, 27 years old. A lot of players used to, in the old days, have to go off and get a job at 27. But if he can get his life right and the support is there, then he should become the poster boy for people not doing what they used to do, and that is lying to get extra contracts, lying on the, the bench, lying you know, or lying by omission hmm. and putting themselves in difficult situations, which then, of course, has the knock-on effect, pardon the pun, of everyone involved, people bumping into you, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, we're at a really interesting time. But I, I, I'm going to, I'll come back to you next week. I want to talk about the drugs next week and I want to talk extensively about it on Wednesday night on Footy Classified. And I just think now... It is – I've always felt football was a semi-professional game. Getting paid doesn't make it professional. And I think, you know, you look at the draft and you've got father, sons and local academies and 
uh, all sorts of things. You know, it, it's so compromised that it, it makes no sense half the time. You know, there, there is a time when we need to say, right, okay, what, what is this game? What does it stand for? The concussion situation has brought itself on. But again, you know, everyone's got to be professional. You know, if you get knocked, if you get hit reasonably hard, you've got to report it to the doctor and you don't go to a nightclub that night and you don't be taking drugs during the off-season or during the season or anything else. You don't get on the grog and you look after yourself. And I think there's got to be a lot more mm. protocol involved in all of this. Now that we're getting to the stage where people are suing for millions of dollars, I think it's game over for all the old-fashioned ways of footy. Just uh, on the Angus Brayshaw thing, the, the thing that stands out the most for me is, and, and you touched on it too when you are describing um, Angus as a, as a player and a person, is it what makes it more unique is a player pulling the pin will retiring because um, of the concussion in, issue is it the peak of their powers? Yeah. And, and you, you're starting to touch on it. Well, do I sort of drag it out? Can I get another contract? This is not a player who's towards the end going, look, that's one too many. I'm near the end anyway. Yeah, it's right in the peak of his powers, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, like yeah. I said, you, you touched on it. Premiership, key part of the Melbourne side that's been in big finals campaigns, would be playing out there round one, starting on the wing or halfback, wherever he's playing this year, yeah. leader, all that sort of stuff. I think that's what makes it so unique. And I think that's where... Going forward, we might see more players, even in the middle or the peak of their career, I'm not saying they'll all pull the pin, but there'll be a consideration. Not yeah. like, oh, no, well, I'll just I'll well, tough it, it took out. tremendous bravery from Angus Brayshaw mm. to do the entire pre-season. You know, <laughs> no one likes doing the pre-season. <laughs> he did all of that, you know, and he's obviously down there and he, as a leader of the club <laughs> through, through, you know, tumultuous times at Melbourne. He was very important for them mm. in their pre-season, I would have thought. And then to make that decision. But I think what we have to do is now just go to realism. And it's a bit like what I was saying before and what you're saying about, you know, what happens to uh, uh, Jimmy Webster. Let's not drive things mad. Hmm. You clean somebody up like that, you get six. Hmm. You yep. know, if you clean them up like Pearl Pepper, you get four. Yep. You Good. hit somebody. If you throw a punch, it starts at one and then it goes up from there. Jump a punch, any punch, hmm. you throw a punch, even if you're tempted to strike. They used to rub you out for attempting to strike hmm. back in the day. But the problem for Jimmy is he, he's ticked every box that everyone's been talking about not to do. Yeah. He left the ground and the AFL said, well, once you leave the but ground... He, he's a, but he's done the AFL a favour. Yeah. Because they can come out today without any worries whatsoever and just go, bang. Well, they'll go see you at the tribunal. Yeah. And then they'll ring St Kilda and go, he's going to probably get this. What do you want to do? We can make this... 20 minutes or we can make it three hours? Well, I think it would be a good thing for St Kilda to come out and just say, right, we okay, we've looked at it as well. Um, you, you give know, us your recommendation. We, look, we'll cop five, you know, and they go, no, we're going to give you six. And you go, well, okay, mm. that's six. Because next week will be one of their players who gets cleaned up. So, you know, it swings and roundabouts and all these sorts of things. Um, let's talk a little bit about so, – so with all that, mm. uh, in, in wrapping it up, we're – we're, f- we're all in on the concussion. Um, yeah, yeah. I still think that we need to get those concussion passports going from junior football. Yes. And these are the things. The other thing I think we have to get, and this was something that has that is on the desk of the AFL just before we wrap up the concussion, and that is for a no-fault concussion fund. Now, the fund has gone to the Players Association. There's plenty of money in it, and they're doing great work, Paul Marsh and the AFL working together. Everyone wants to come to a elegant and empathetic position on concussion over the side we've got people trying to run class actions which is a different thing altogether won't get involved in that Mm. have some thoughts we might talk about another day but going forward if we have a scenario where somebody who does have that situation um, where there is a pension in play for them if they're at a suitable situation where they can't really do a lot of things that they are suffering so it is affecting their after football work activities then I think we can actually get to a good position what we have to be careful on in this of course is you look at any of these good ideas that come up like the NDIS for example where the people who have got kids with autism and and the like can't get near the funds because everybody's lined up and siphoned the money dry with uh, you know rorts and carry on so it has to be really stringently Policed so that the right people get the lion's share of the money. One quick one. Um, I, I know we're, we're trying to wrap it up. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where here's your standard playing contract? So 
Ed McGuire, you're to say you're on your third contract, you're sitting there with your manager. Before we get your standard playing contract, here are the terms and conditions and what you're willing to accept. You know, you could suffer from concussion. Are you willing to still play? We need you to sit there and there'll be football manager, your player manager, and maybe the club's legal. Just going, do you completely understand what you're signing up for? Do you reckon we'll ever get to that stage? So before you sign your standing playing contract, you need to know what you're... You know, undertaking as far as being an I, I think that should be put, that just should be the standard contract. Do I mean, I think I think it was um, in the past it was understood that that was the case. Yeah, it's understood. I mean, you we're play you play football. We're in a litigious world now. Yeah. So, but I think that makes sense. Well, I mean, we always have been. But it yeah. makes makes no sense not to do it. To be perfectly honest, mm. we're at the MCG. Is that yes. the crowd running out? Is it? Yep. Oh no, they've got some. Uh, they've got their heads up on the screen. They're giving them a test run. Uh, by the way, the MCG, the grass is all Looks out. Great. And is looking great. Needs needs to be rolled bit more but they've got uh, another week and that that'll if we get we're going to get 30 degrees in the back half of this week for about five days the mcg will be right so that looks really good um back to your point yeah no th- there's no doubt collingwood i know uh brought nathan murphy and his parents in to the board and they sat down with him and they had the doctors and they had everybody mm. that you need to have to say to him right here's the situation um you know, the doctors say, you're okay, um, but how are you going? So then he went through all the pre-season and he was tackled actually by Nick Dacos and, you know, dumped into the ground and he's now having a bit of a rest at that. But, you know, you have a look at it. In the grand final when it was uh, McCarthy, I think, who cleaned him up, there was no, no issue with what McCarthy did yeah. because that was just a genuine football act and poor old Nathan Murphy was wide open. McCarthy was going for the ball had his shoulder tucked in and made contact with him. And if anything, you know, you probably argue that Nathan Murphy's head made contact with McCarthy going straight for the ball. That's why we've got to make sure that we don't go over the top. That is a football act. That is something that happens. Players will get knocked out. When you've got somebody like Jimmy Webster or somebody's whacking somebody behind play or something like that, different thing altogether, throw the book at him. So I think they got that right as far yep. as uh, the grand final was concerned. But uh, to your point... I think that that needs to be part of the standard contract. I think everybody, and uh, you know, you have to take that into effect. It is a rough and tumble game, and uh, there, there are there are incidental contacts everywhere, and even Gaelic football has incidental contact. Any game where you run into it, netball has head contact at times, and that's just part of the game. But what we have to do is once people get that contact, is really drill down and, and work out where they are. And make sure they're okay going forward. Simple yep. as that. Honesty is going to be there. Now, you, how many time, how many players have you known over the years who've who've fudged the the concussion test? I mean, in the old days, everyone used to run dead on the con- mm. test, so they look smarter when mm. they were concussed. There's a couple that said they run dead, but I think that was covering up the fact that they were bozos. Look, I, but <laughs> oh, I, know, I, I deliberately ran dead. I go, I'm not sure you had to try that hard to run dead. I know <laughs> that there was a situation in a major game, and I won't say any more than that. In the last three years, where a player went in to the game with a con- got through the concussion protocol <clears throat> and got to play and was cleaned up or had a concussion early in the game and uh, was asked what quarter it was while he's looking up at the scoreboard that has Q1 on it. Okay, you know where you are and out you go, out you go, out you go to play. Not North Melbourne, by the way, but yeah, hmm. they haven't played in a big game for 15 years. Oh, <laughs> they were a big side in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Opening round. Yes. yes. Our, our two well, sides. I want to hear from you. I'm talking a lot. I want to hear from you. No. What, do you what do you think of that? I round? think it's fantastic. I think it's a genuine investment in actually, we'll call them the Northern Clubs. They, uh, they are Northern. Oh, hang on. You, you, you're talking as a GWS director as well yeah. and also as a football lover. Yeah, because I... I obviously spent a fair bit of time up there. I, I see the impact it has. I know um, Giants Collingwood is 95% sold at the moment. And I understand that the Giants membership is has taken off. Giants yeah. membership is at a record level. Um, yeah. That's obviously because they got a big game to come to, also off the back of last year. Yeah. Sydney, uh, the Sydney's game, the SCG is 90% sold. I'm not sure about the two Queensland teams, but all reports, they're going really well. Um, you throw in the back of Gold Coast, new coach. They've had all the draftees from their new area. It's a genuine investment. I don't know why people are getting their nose out of joint. The MCG will be cherry ripe the week after. You telling me? Matter. You telling me that there won't be ninety thousand here 
Richmond Cup. Uh, there'll be 90,000 for Collingwood Swans to unfurl the flag. Yes, well, so, so so you get blockbuster after blockbuster. The other thing that people don't realise, and obviously it's in my forehand, is that you will also get this week four prime time telecast mm. games and the media going at 100 miles an hour. Not another week. Mm. We've been complaining for for years that the rugby league starts and gets two or three yeah. or four weeks head start on us. Doesn't necessarily matter that much, but to to get the focus of it into the northern states, I think it's a great thing. Yep. You can't do enough of these things. No. You know, give people what they want. Do you want people want footy? Do you want to watch the footy this weekend? Do, you, do I want to watch Collingwood play GWS? My word. <laughs> when we've seen how many the, the crowds at the practice matches this year. I mean, yesterday, St Kilda and North Melbourne at Moravan was magnificent. You know, the games uh, Collingwood played Richmond at uh, at Princes Park at uh, Icon Park, full, great, unbelievable. And you know what? Everyone sat there, mm. weren't going off their heads. They watched it. They knew it was a practice match. Everybody was right. And yeah. I just think it was sensational. Right. Having said that, let's uh, roll it, into the NRL. Yeah, Vegas, baby. Vegas. Now, I, somebody who would know sent me a text who was actually at the game it, at, uh, at, in Vegas yesterday and said they're going to lose $8 million Oof. on That's this. That's a startup cost, though, isn't That's it? That's a startup cost. No, so I'm, I'm for it. Mm. Okay. But I, had, I spoke to another friend in New York who didn't even know it was on. Um, so that's okay because things that happen in Vegas and New York, it's like things that happen in Cairns and Melbourne. You don't know what's going on. Um, so I think it was a really good thing for Peter Volandi's strategy to get into the betting system. Right? Peter runs New South Wales Racing. He ra- understands this situation. He understands that as more betting explodes in the US, um, it, uh, it goes to the next level. And if he can become a regular betting uh, product overseas, then that's going to be worth millions of dollars to him. So that's where his $10 million investment is. I thought it was interesting that they marketed themselves on the brutality of the game while we're talking about all this concussion stuff. They went out and said, you guys don't wear pads, look at this. And I've watched a lot of, uh, of gridiron, American football, in the last few months in the preparation to go to see the, the, the Super Bowl, which was absolutely magnificent. But I did think watching the rugby yes, the rugby league yesterday, that the pace of the game, you know, the six tackles, not stopping after every play for 30 seconds and the timeouts, it really, you know, it was really fast-paced. So when I, you know, when I look forward to seeing the AFL this week when I'll be, be looking like everyone's running around unbelievably. But I thought it was a good spectacle. Um, well, ideally, they would have liked the field to be actually full size. Did you know this, the field was actually smaller? Yeah, it was, yeah. But which, which creates a tighter contest. Which is what impact. kills us going overseas. There's mm. no grounds that are big mm. enough. You know, MCG is the biggest cricket ground in the world. But I'm with you. Like, he is a, a big picture, a big visionary, Peter Volandis, and you've got to admire it. He, he, you know, all right, let's take it on and let's go shoot for the moon sort of stuff. And we've had this discussion before. So... You've got the AFL, 18 professional teams. You've got feeder competitions. You've got NRL, same. Uh, rugby union's got professional teams. We've got netball. We've got basketball. The amount of professional teams we've got in a population of 26 million is extraordinary. Yeah, it is, yeah. It, it's just only so many banks and car yards and dealerships and things that you Sponsorship can... Sponsorship stuff and, and tough TV economy. channels yeah. and things like that. You've got to find new ways to make money to stay competitive. Well, look, free-to-air TVs. You, know, you saw uh, the annual reports of mm-hmm. 7 and 9. And, you know, it's been tough. It's been a, tad, a tough ad market. If you can get another four games at rate into your television schedule, and for Foxtel, um, the NRL, you know, how many people would have made sure they've got KO on? There's a, there's a drop-off between the footy season and the start of the footy season. Kicks up again when the cricket's on, but people turn it off because people know the system now. They'll turn off for a month, hmm. save the money, come back on. And, uh, you know, so that would have been a great fill-up for Foxtel. And certainly Channel 9's ratings were, were very, very strong. So the, the net result of all that, it's a bit like talking about the night grand final. Mm. Um, you know, there's other aspects than just playing. Hmm. You've got to be financially strong. We see, well, you know, unions going through there. Did there, you notice, uh, I'll just, the, the, the grand final was as good as it could possibly be, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. Except for the shadows on the ground. No, I don't. We're not. We, you've got another twenty odd weeks to talk about your night grand final. <laughs> well, I'm just telling you. No. Okay, it was actually mentioned by the commentators at one stage. Can't see the ball in this forward pocket. That makes sense, doesn't it? 
especially when worried about concussion and everything else. Anyway, I just... We're opening <laughs> round and you're talking about a night grand final. No, I'm not, I'm not. I'm just talking... No, we're talking about the business of sport. Yes. And and getting the best possible conditions for yeah, people. The, even if, How many know, games are being played in the daytime? Uh, in this the, week? Yeah. They're all at night, aren't they? Or at yeah, least twilight. I yeah, know. Uh, yeah. oh, yeah. Three yeah, of them are at night. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. But the last um, little bit, if you can even create uh, like a smaller TV um, content package with a US provider, it, it's small for US scale, but it's big for Australia. So, yeah. again, you, you've got to make your sport financially strong. You do. And look, they got on uh, on television in America yesterday. The, the main channel they couldn't get on because there was a, a minor league basketball mm. game that went into extra time. So they put them on the secondary channel, but then they brought it over straight away. So, you know, they probably got the lead in from the basketball anyway. Mm. But, yeah, uh, but I'm just all for let's make – we're a small country. Mm. We need to get as many things going for us as possible, which also means – I mean, I, I sit in, in shaking my head with them talking about, oh, we're going to paint the seats at the Gabba for the Olympic Games. The, the Brisbane Olympic Games in 2032 are coming off Paris and L.A., we need to be doing a little bit more than that. <laughs> We've got some background noise there, Jimmy, yeah. because they're actually playing the intro for the Hawthorne Football Club at the moment. It's Will McCabe, number 27. He's up on the screen. Uh, there you go. Number 28, Cam McKenzie. Very good player, Cam McKenzie. All right, so that's happening in the background. Yeah. That's what's happening here at the MCG. Um, the drug situation over the summer, I said, we're going to have a good look at this on Wednesday night on Footy Classified and next week when we sit down again. Um, it was pretty horrific. Yep. I know everyone ducks and weaves on this stuff, but it was pretty, pretty very. It was really disconcerting watching everything that was happening. Yeah, I, I think we will do a deep dive on what we want. Yeah. The the drugs, I guess, program or um, protocol or however you you want to put a it. A good look at it. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a deep dive. What? But what do can we I just ask you? Do you do you have you got the same feeling as as me that it was went to a new level this year? Um, well, maybe it was just, you know... Yeah, not a new level for me. I, mm. I don't know. I, I don't know what to expect. I, I'm more curious of what people want the, the drug policy to be. Yeah. Like, do, do we want it the, the catch them or do we want it the health medical protocol that they use at the moment? I, mm. I, that's a question I, I don't know. And I, when you ask people, I get mixed responses. Yeah, it is. And it, it's, it, it's a bit like the you know, the concussion in a lot of ways. I mean, mm. how long do we have, oh, that's the death of the death of the bump and all that, but then no one ever cleaned it up. Mm. So we have to, well, I think, what nearly 20 years, about 18, 19 years since the drug code came in. Mm. Time for a look, but we'll come back to that one. Bartel medal. Jimmy, dubbed harder the win than the brown low, and you and know because you won one. Well, who, I, who were your three in the in the grand final, just out of curiosity? Oh, I gave Bobby Hill. I'm trying to remember. Richard could probably... Let me know. I know Bobby Hill. Got Bailey? The, uh, Bailey. Did you, go, did you? I've heard you gave two. Crisp, I think I might have given Crisp a vote. Yeah. Crispy boys. Pendlebury. Pendlebury's excellent. Oh, no, we did this uh, double vote, so I think Pendlebury got in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Who yeah. was your best? Oh, Bobby. Bobby Hill. Okay. So starting next week, we'll be into it. Uh, the three best players across opening around will get votes. And it's not a strict thing. I just go rogue some weeks just to doctor it up, so... Just a G May up occasionally. Yeah, okay, occasionally. Okay. Um, what's your, what are you looking forward to this year, mate, in the footy? Um, I, I'm fascinated by the, the additions to a couple of clubs. Like, do the two big key backs actually help Port get over the hump? Are they good enough in the forward line? I'm actually interested to see how West Coast go. They've got so many young, talented players. I do want to watch Harley Reid play. Um, Gold Coast is for me. I, I Gold just Coast. Dimmer, and and they've, they've all grown into their bodies. Those young kids are now prime time mm. and they've got some good players up there so I think they'll they'll be great your I'm mob your mob are interesting the you know, Giants think, yeah I think they're going to power I'm, I'm fascinated to see the Cats can their young players make that pop and it's not just Hawkins Cameron Duncan Dangerfield Stewart I like Brisbane again to go well I think yeah. Collingwood will go well Carlton have got a, a question mark from me only on the injuries yeah. that's all Essendon are a fascinating watch if Essendon don't go great in the first half of the year, it'll be interesting. Well, I don't think Essendon can compete with... any of the teams that we just mentioned. No, I don't think so, but it, it's well, the way they play we want to see. <laughs> yeah, but, but you still get done. How do you reckon they're going to go? Oh, they're not playing finals. No. 
<laughs> what about North? North of, two, that, like north tw- of two years 25,000 days since Essendon won a final. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about... Uh, it's not fantastic. Sorry, yeah, no, sorry, like Essendon, sorry, Essendon supporters. <laughs> Got a family full of them, so... Yeah. Um, but... Uh, uh, and, and North, what do you think of North? I mean, I think... I, I must say, I think that they handled the Taron Thomas situation as well as you possibly could, yep. both last year and then this year. And... Uh, you know, I've been enthused by their practice match form against Collingwood. Now, it wasn't a full-on game. And yesterday, you know, they, they had moments where they, they probably could have, you know, got to the front and gone a bit further ahead. But, yeah, I think there's there's a lot to like there. And I think Alistair Clarkson should just not listen to mm. Kane Corns ribbing him and getting into him and just do what he needs to do. And that is coach mm. this team to be a power in three years' time. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to watching North Melbourne as a team. I love watching North Melbourne's individual players play. I really enjoy watching Larky play. Yep. I love watching Luke Davies Uniac play footy. Simpkin. Sheasel. Yeah, Sheasel. Even um Paul Curtis. Yeah. Lively on the forward line. Something looks like it's gonna happen. I they've the, got individuals, even Dersma. Dersma was good yesterday. I yeah. like that. But now when it now starts to convert as a as a team, yeah. they'll be way but individuals. They've got some fun players to watch. And my man, Biggie Newen. Biggie, yeah. yeah big, big I is, saw Biggie. Yeah. Biggie's a ripper. Big, Biggie's a family friend. There, there's some opportunities and, uh, for some key position players there at North because there's yeah. a still in a lot of their key posts. You're like, well, there's an opportunity for you. Yeah. yeah. So good luck. It's going to be a great footy season. I tell you what, I'm looking forward to everything. Yeah. I, I'm really enthused about the footy this year and sitting here as we are at the MCG and just looking at it again. Even when the MCG is empty, it's uh, it's something special, and uh, you know it's going to be. I think it's going to be just a school kids a magnificent doing the. How many of those school kids down there as we're talking, they're looking at the MCG, there'll be three or four be thinking, I can't wait to play out here. Yep. That's the best thing. Do you, what was your first memory of the MCG? I came, my mum brought me here during the school holidays. We did the tour and I've got a photo still and I think they put it up at um, Kinnear Park Gym, HBA Stadium. And as you do as a kid, yep. you held up the replica Premiership Cup and I actually held up a brown load, but I held up the cup and said to mum, I'm going to win one of these one day. And, of course, you're, you're seven or eight. And she goes, yeah, sure, no race, love. Like, yeah, yeah just make sure you go to school. And exactly. they've got the photo up. They did have it up at Caninia Park after we won a flag. Just holding the cup. And Fantastic. Said, I'm going to win one of those. Good stuff. Yeah. I remember I came, the old Southern stand that was here, I came to watch uh, Collingwood play Richmond. And uh, we, we walked across from Richmond Station, across what was the paddocks in those days outside the MCG. And uh, I remember walking in, and you had to walk up to go down into the bowl section in those days. And as I walked up, and I'm only six or five or six or something, six or seven, and uh, with my dad and my brother, and as we got up, all I could see was the blue skies. Like today, it was a perfect blue sky day. So you saw the blue sky, and then I got to the top, and then all I could see was the stand on the other, and it was full, and the colour, and the noise, and the smell, and then the expanse of green grass. Just wow. So this yeah. uh, sensory overload. <laughs> and Peter McKenna kicked nine against oh, Richmond this day. So that was that was it. Awesome. Wow. What a place. Did I love the game. Still do. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks. We'll catch up soon. Uh, please, uh, as we said, subscribe to Eddie and Jimmy wherever you listen to us. You can watch us on Nine Now and YouTube.